Buonasera a tutti, la nostra caffè cultura. Io sono Daniela Amico Henderson, responsabile di eventi culturali per la Dana Society Michigan Chapter. Today we are here to initiate a celebration. Um, we are international uh, month. And uh, our guest are here, and uh, we have the honor to have the Council of Italy in Detroit, uh, and then, as you can see in the screen, our special guest, Michael Pacitti. Um, but I leave. Um, the uh, floor to Ms. Baistrocchi. Buonasera, grazie Daniela. I am Allegra Baistrocchi. I am the Consul of Italy in Detroit, and I am super enthusiastic to be with all of you in front of this distinguished public today because March is Women in History Month. And I love women in history and I love even more Italian women in history. And so we're honoring today one of our prominent Italians, Matilde Serrao. But first and foremost, I need to thank the Dante Alighieri, which is my partner in crime in all things Italian. So President Elia Delphi and uh, the fabulous Amica Henderson, who's, as she said, curates all the Dante events. Thank you, ladies. Let me tell you, it is uh, a, an honor to celebrate women with such fantastic women such as yourself. Um, and then on top of that, I would like to thank uh, Michael Pacitti for being with us today. He is one of the most knowledgeable individuals on the subject of Matilde Serrao, uh, the woman that we are celebrating, uh, given that he's also an official translator of Matilde's novella. I happen to have one of his works here, ta-da. So siamo onorati, grazie. Uh, we're honored to have you here and we're excited to hear more about the woman who was so passionate about her works. And, um, you know, before I pass on the proverbial metaphorical mic over to Dr. Pacitti, let me just say very two words of why we're celebrating her here today. So she was a great Italian writer and journalist and to her goes the honor of being and the burden, I would say also, the first woman to have founded and directed a newspaper. And in her life, she would have founded and directed actually three of them. So that's kind of a big deal. She was also nominated six times for the Nobel Prize in Literature. So she was undoubtedly a strong, tenacious, fighting woman. We actually have a quote from Italian historian Momigliano, who called her la più grande pittrice di folle che abbia dato il nostro verismo, the greatest painter of folly that has ever come from the Italian realism movement. So I will let Dr. Pacitti talk about Matilde and her story. I'm excited to showcase an Italian woman during this historic month. We want to acknowledge her as a trailblazer, but since I have your attention, I would also like to draw it to the social media account of uh, our consulate. Look us up, Italy and Detroit. We're on Facebook. We're on Instagram and we are on Twitter because for the whole of the month we will be showcasing other incredible women as well so if it can be a bit of a teaching experience if it can be a moment in which we share I love sharing I see we have in our audience another fabulous Italian woman in history Pierrette Ciao, Pierrette Simpson, who's an author, and you know she's a survivor of the Andrea Doria, and she's a documentarist, and so we have fantastic experiences also of Italian women here in Michigan, which makes me really excited. We've already done uh, a small social media post on Artemisia Gentileschi, which the the DIA is is showcasing in an exhibit. If you haven't gone from now until Mar uh, May 29th, you have plenty of time. And with her other Italian women painters between the 15th and 18th hundreds. So please go and see it. My personal favorite was Sofonisba, as I mentioned to Kiret. Um, today, we also did a post on Rita Levi Montalcini. So a woman that's a lifetime senator, but also Nobel, for, Nobel, Nobel Prize for Medicine. So we're trying to really showcase the women that in Italian history have made a difference. And so it is even more pressing that we are talking about Matilde Serrano.
Rao. So grazie, Dr. Paciti, for honoring us with your presence today. We are very excited to hear more from you. Um, can I just add, viva l'Italia and viva le donne. So, Sempre. grazie. <laughs> grazie, Allegra. Um, presentation, I just wanted to remind our guest that I, um, our speaker, Michael Paciti, is connected to London, and uh, he uh, translated two of the house novellas and um, so these two are 30 percent 30 percent and lucky Lam numbers Terno Seco, and are now available single volume on kindle now um michael we are very excited uh, to listen the story through your words that you discover um through La Serao words in our book. So, with that, I conclude my presentation and I look forward to hear from you. Well, thank you all very much. This is, the honor is mine being uh, able to make this presentation this evening. And thank you, Leah, and thank you, Daniela, for all your help. And Allegra, thank you very much for introducing uh, uh, me and, above all, Matilde Serao. I'd like to begin with her own words. She said of herself, I think quite early in her career, scrivo dappertutto e di tutto con audacia unica, conquisto il mio posto a forza di urti, di gomitate, col fitto e ardente desiderio di arrivare, senza avere nessuno che mi aiuti o quasi nessuno. Ma tu sai che io non do ascolto alle debolezze del mio sesso e tiro avanti per la vita come se fossi un giovanotto. She's hard to pin down. She's hard to pin down, Matilda Serio, Serio. She doesn't fit stereotypes. And she presents so many contradictions that it's hard to believe that she was just one woman. It isn't actually that clear when she was born. The different sources gave 1856 or 1857 and different dates. But be that as it's May, um, one source indicates that she was born on the 7th of March, 1857, which would neatly imply that tomorrow is the 165th anniversary of her birth. So we wish her a happy birthday. What we do know for sure is that she was born in Patras in Greece, and her mother, Paulina Bonelli, was, was Greek. Um, later in life, Matilda Serao, I think, allowed the myth to circulate that her mother was descended from Fanariot nobility. Um, that's the noble family of Constantinople. Her father, Francesco, was a journalist of sorts who had fled Naples, left Naples after the 1848 uprisings against the Bourbons, and he sought refuge in Greece. She was very much dedicated to her mother. Her father didn't feature a great deal in her life, it has to be said, but her mother certainly did. And she reappears in some of the stories and in some of the stories that I've translated. I will come around to give you a tiny portrait of her later, a miniature portrait of uh, Paulina Bonelli later. But that's perhaps the origin of Serao's diophysitism is her dual nature in so many things. She was both Italian, she was born in Greece. She was a feminist trailblazer, but she was quite an outspoken anti-feminist. She was a hard-bitten journalist, and she was a best-selling writer of romantic fiction. She was a dedicated salonier. She very much liked to enjoy the hospitality of the minor nobility, and in some cases the major nobility, and yet she was also a woman of the people, very much of the people of her own city, of Naples. And above all, she was a force of nature. She was one of the best-selling writers of her time. She was one of the most translated Italian writers of her time. She was writer, editor, and joint owner of three newspapers, and the first woman to found a daily newspaper, as Allegro already mentioned. And she still managed to raise four sons and an adopted daughter. And she put up for a long time, probably longer than was necessary, with an absolutely appalling husband. And we'll learn about Scarfolio later. 
In her own words, she said she was una bimba grossa, grassa, con i capelli castani, ruvidi e folti, una bocca rotonda, sempre aperta alle risate, alle canzoni, agli strilli di gioia, come tutte le bambine robuste, dalle salute, dalla salute esuberante. Io non giocavo con le bambole, ma giocavo con la trottola. Non sapevo passeggiare, sapevo correre dietro un cerchio, dietro una palla, dietro un volano, forse frenate e nei viali dei giardini pubblici. Non avevo né grazia né dolcezza, sembravo un maschiotto. Ma quello che affliggeva mia madre, disposta a tutti per donarmi, salve questo. Era il mio orrore per qualunque studio, per qualunque occupazione tranquilla. She wasn't much of a student. She didn't learn to read or write until she was about nine. And this was during a period when her mother, Paulina, suffered a serious illness. And in her long convalescence, Matilda permitted herself to be instructed in the rudiments of reading and writing. And here's where the depiction of Caterina's mother in Terno Sec Secco is almost certainly a miniature portrait of her mother. If I can quote from my own translation, she says, in the depths of the ensuing silence, the French lady, the French lady is the lady of the novel, uh, Caterina's mother, who's a teacher of French. She's known in her quartiere as the French lady. The French lady appeared at the corner of Via Don Albina with her daughter Caterina leaning on her arm. Both of them were exhausted. The signora from the lessons she'd been giving all day, which almost sapped the last of her breath from her weak lungs. The daughter from being shut up in the schoolroom all day, which depressed her too ardent spirit. Their apartment is almost certainly a description of the Serao's own family home. It was so sparsely furnished that it didn't take much to keep it clean. The bedroom was almost totally occupied by the big, typically Neapolitan bed made of wrought iron, a chest of drawers with a wooden top, a miserable little dressing table made of painted walnut, a coat rack and a couple of chairs. They were not very well off, the Scarfolio, uh, the, sorry, the Serao household. But thanks to her mother's persistence, Matilda finally got a high school diploma in 1874 which allowed her to take a job at the State Telegraph office. While there, she started writing, and between 1876 and 1878, she wrote short articles for local magazines, and she wrote the draft of her first novel, which, in 1881, the publishing house Casanova published with the title Cuore Infermo, which was translated as The Ailing Heart. It's too late, alas, for a mother to witness because Paulina passed away in 1879, but she would have been proud, I think, of Matilde. And this is where Serao's really, so Matilde Serao's story really begins. Cuore Infermo appears on the face of things to be a traditional story of love, marriage, infidelity, but the characters have an intensity and sensuality that hadn't been seen really at that point in Italian women's writing. And Remember, this had no tradition of women writers. There had been women writers, of course, but not a tradition in the way that um, English writing had with Jane Austen or George Eliot or the French with Georges Sand. A more appropriate uh, comparison would perhaps be with the Bronte sisters, with their own tales of passion and love, both requited and unrequited. But Serao, on her own in the south of Italy, produced something that went far beyond the Brontes. So Quarry Infermo, if you haven't read it, deals with a character called, central character called Beatrice San Giorgio and her husband Marcello and Lalla D'Aragona. Beatrice, Beatrice is cold and distant towards her husband. And it's interesting that Serao chose the name Beatrice because I think she wanted to imply this kind of ideal uh, woman in the Dante-esque sense of, uh, of Beatrice uh, from the Stil Noir. But Beatrice San Giorgio is, is cold and distant towards her husband. Her heart is ailing. It prevents her from being able to express or experience or to show him love. So Marcello seeks comfort in the arms of the sensual and dangerous Lalla D'Aragona. This in Southern Italy in 1881 is genuinely hot stuff. But it's more than that. Serao, Serao realizes the dichotomy between the two central characters, between Lalla and Beatrice. Lala is a modern woman. She's passionate. She's strange. She's superficial. 
she realizes that the heart, forgive the pun, the heart of the matter is really the dyad of the two women as doubles, a splitting of the female figure in the text. Lala expresses this to Marcello when she tells him, you're in love, but you come here to my house to love the woman who will not love you in your own home. The novelty in Serao is that the primary fascination in the story isn't so much between Beatrice and Marcello, not even between Lalo, Lala and Marcello. The central curiosity is the interest in what is being felt by the two women. It's an obsessive interest. It's a desire to meet each other, to try to understand or to see what the other person is. An obsessive interest in what each feels for the other. And in fact, to the point of recognition, the point of their first meeting, there's a shock of recognition, and it suggests a collision not just between opposites, but between two individuals, two selves inhabiting one woman. And Quarry Inferno was a milestone for Serao. It was a big success for her. It took her to Rome. And in Rome, she found work as a writer and a contributor of articles to Capitan Fracassa, which, of course, was a, a very well-known satirical magazine. If you think The New Yorker rather than Time, we're probably closer there. It published articles on current and cultural affairs, and it included some really big names among its contributors, including Eduardo Scarfolio and Gabriele D'Annunzio, a very young Gabriele D'Annunzio. So now Serao is really in the big league. Her second novel, Fantasia, which came out in 1884, I think is even more successful than Cuore Infermo. Fantasia, eh, Fantasia, excuse me, opens with two schoolgirls, Lucia Altamare and Caterina Capietra. They're best friends. And the novel opens with them swearing eternal fidelity and friendship to each other. Lucia, in this case, is Eros and Thanatos combined. Caterina is conventional, constant reserve. Does this sound familiar? I think this is where it might sound familiar to fans of Elena Ferrante, for example. Our Serao stresses the friendship between the two women as more than a simple prelude to any significant traditional relationship between a man and a woman. The girls do, however, they grow and marry. Um, but when Lucia is tempted to embark on an affair with Caterina's husband, Andrea, the betrayal is expressed as a sin against their friendship rather than against the sacrament of marriage. It's Lucia who informs Caterina, who writes to Caterina to tell her that she's loped with Andrea. I'm afraid I'm going to spoil it here. So if you don't want to know what happens, you can mute. Um, the spoiler is Caterina very calmly and methodically, having been informed of her husband's infidelity, makes arrangements to take her own life. But the catalyst, the reason why she does this, why it's so catastrophic for her, isn't the betrayal by her husband, it's the betrayal by her best friend. That's at the core of Fantasia. And that I think was novel, certainly, in Italian literature at its time, to put women protagonists right at the forefront. Dynamic is, dynamic is between them, the tension is between them. And the male characters are the extras, if you like. Anyway, through her novels and her journalism, uh, Serao was making him name and a great career for herself. But the parad paradox is that despite her success and her the success that she achieved, which was entirely down to her own efforts. The paradox is that many of her articles, the articles for Capitan Fracassa, were vehemently opposed to reforms that might have improved women's lives. She wrote in opposition to female emancipation and in to, to divorce. And later in the 1880s, she even supported the decision by the Ospedale Maggiore in Milan to reject an application by Anna Kulishov because she was a woman. Anna Kulishov, in case you didn't know, was one of the first women to graduate with a medical degree. She graduated from Naples. And I really wanted to mention Anna Kulishov this evening because she came from Ukraine. She came from the Crimea. 
And I think in these days, um, it's quite important to give Anna Kuleshov the, uh, the recognition I think that she deserves. Later in, of course, she was a companion to Filippo Turati. So supporting the Hospitale Maggiore and rejecting Anna Kuleshov was not Strauss' finest hour. You can speculate about the reasons for her antipathy, her antipathy as it seemed to feminism. Her biographer, Anna Banti, Anna Banti wrote a fantastic biography of Matilde Serrao, which was published in 1965 by Youth of Torino. Um, Banti suggests that this antipathy towards feminism may have been due to the malevolent influence of uh, Scarfoglio, of Eduardo Scarfoglio, or perhaps Serrao's own feelings of inadequacy as an autodidact uh, who's working in an industry that was, which was populated by highly intelligent and cultural people, most of whom were men, of course. Anna Banti suggests that it might have been Sirawa's defense mechanism, a way of not sticking her neck out, a way of not exposing herself to criticism. Whatever her writing, whatever angle her writing seemed to take, however, her actions spoke volumes. She went from strength to strength, her career was in vertical takeoff. The Fantasia appeared in 1883, in fact, and Eduardo Scarfoglio hated it. He said, se alcuno avesse la pazienza di fare analisi chimica dai romanzi della signorina Serao, troverebbe un miscuglio di excuse me, reminiscenze amalgamate insieme alla papparella di una prosa qua cingotante con la più petulante sguaiataggine del dialetto della borghesia napoletana, la incipriata d'un polverina francese. Scarfoglio didn't mince his words, but, uh, and he was quite cruel. But that wasn't all. He also said that her work was derivative. He said it took everything that was bad about Georges Sand, who was, of course, a woman called Amantine Dupin, or Zola or Flaubert, and she, Serao made it worse. Scafolio hated the French. Mathilde Serao loved them. Scafolio's own novel, Libro di Don Quixote, failed miserably. Perhaps he was just jealous. But time and again, he repeated, Mathilde non sa scrivere. But Perhaps like Elizabeth Bennett and Darcy, there was some deus ex machina that was driving them together. And that was just the kind of thing that Scarfoglio hated in Serao's romantic fiction. But whatever antipathy he felt for her professionally, perhaps it was an act, he was quite besotted with her. And she, it seems, was besotted with him because they were married on the 28th of February, 1885. And in May, the first child, a girl, was still born. Now, this might have knocked anyone out, but Matilde Serao got back to work. In 1884, she showed her journalistic mettle. A cholera outbreak had swept through the overcrowded and squalid narrow streets and slums of Naples, and it caused up to 7,000 mortalities. It wasn't the first time, it certainly wouldn't be the last. And the reaction of the Prime Minister at the time, Agostino de Pretis, was that the only solution would be to sventrare Napoli, to gut Naples. Naturally, Matilde Serrao sharpened her pencil to defend her hometown. She said that it wasn't so much to sventrare Napoli, but to rifare Napoli. In Capitan Fracassa, she published a series of essays which were later collected together under the title Il Ventri di Napoli, The Belly of Naples, which itself is co of a title of a novel by Emile Zola called The Belly of Paris. These essays begin with a sharp rebuke for Prime Minister de Bretis and his ill-informed appraisal of the issues affecting Naples. Serrao described in minute detail the lies and dilemmas of ordinary Neapolitans how they earn or don't earn their livings, what they eat, their obsessions, religious compulsions, their addictions to the lottery, dependence on usurers, and all the picturesque and pious facets of the city. 
Eventually, Napoli made Sirao's reputation made her reputation as a serious journalist, she, as a chronicler of her city, and a journalist with enough moxie to stand up to the prime minister. She examined usury in Naples. She looked at the lottery, the obsession for the lottery, as morphia, um, uh, the liquefaction of the uh, of San Gennaro, the blood of San Gennaro. Um, every aspect of life in Naples, she covered in Inventory di Napoli. And her descriptive power, I think, is one of the things that personally, I find very, very interesting in her work. You feel that you're walking in Naples in the 1880s. But as Cyrano's star rose, Eduardo Scarfoglio's star was in decline. He was young, good looking, well educated. He came from a relatively wealthy family. And he wasn't the sort of person who could deal with failure. He couldn't easily deal with failure. And Sarao must have realized from the very outset that her marriage was not going to be a conventional one. And yet, in spite of it, she worked and produced novels after article and novel after article. And finally, she published La Conquista di Roma in 1885, which was a historical novel. It dealt with the fortunes of a young deputy, a young politician who had, was new uh, to the Italian parliament, which the Italian parliament, of course, had just relocated to Montecitorio this, in, in the 1870s. And the novel plots his ascent and his realization that Rome wasn't everything he believed it, might, it, it was supposed to be. And I think it echoed, to some extent, much of Italy's disillusion with the missed opportunities and what they perceived to be the apparent failures of the unification that they fought so hard for. Although there's a romantic subplot, La Conquista di Roma is primarily historical, and it has elements of the autobiographical experience woven into it. Anna Banti didn't like it very much, but I do. Eduardo Scarfoglio's failure as a writer, however, <clears throat> or rather his inability to accept the sort of criticism that he was only too happy to dish out. And Sirao's increasing fame and notoriety led them to set up a newspaper of their own. The first edition of Corriere di Roma came out at the, towards the end of 1885. Sirao's strength is extraordinary. Undoubtedly, she saw some strengths in Scarfolio, she must have. And she was prepared to overlook his mood swings and his cynicism, his aggressive machismo, his hypercritical superciliousness. But his profligacy and his extravagant tastes threatened everything that they built together. Even after the day, after the day of their marriage, which Gabriele D'Annunzio had uh, described in massive detail in Capitan Fracassa, uh, on the, after the day of their marriage, Eduardo Scarfolio had tried to scrounge 600 lira from one of Sarao's closest friends. He tried to borrow it for Matilda's benefit, of course. But Matilda put up the Scarfolio, and I think she was sensitive to his depressions, I think, which, which were possibly these days we might call bipolar. It's hard to say, but in her next book, uh, La Vita e Aventura di, Aventure di Riccardo Ioana, which was published in 1887, she told the story of an idealistic young journalist who achieves fame, but then fails ignominiously and takes money from his friends and runs off, starts a new newspaper and ultimately finds success, achieves his target, his, his um, target for success to achieve circulation of 100,000 copies of his newspaper, which he does on the very day, the very evening that he's about to sell the newspaper to an investor. But the success that he finds is hollow. He decides not to sell. He decides to continue with his newspaper. But this, the success he finds is hollow. He finds that he sells more newspapers by writing minimal Articles, articles of no interest, simply a diary of the day's events, 
and people will buy more and more copies of this newspaper. There's less creative content and it's just simply dry an announcements of what's been happening in the day. Rise and fall of an ambitious journalist. It sounds a bit like Citizen Kane, doesn't it? But there's more than a trace element of Scarfolio in uh, Ricardo Ioana and his descent into cynicism and hubris. And there's something of herself, some of, something of Sarah herself in Ricardo Ioana too. The awareness that literature rarely pays the bills. And it's the mundane drudgery of newspaper journalism that was putting food on the table and was paying for their children's education and for Scarfolio's extravagant tastes. Both La Conquista di Roma and the Vita e Ventura di Ricardo Iana were low burn successes. By 1887, the Corriere di Roma was in financial difficulty. And despite Sirao's famous writer and Scarfolio's notoriety as a pub polemicist, they were in dire need of funds. In February of 1887, Matteo Schilizzi, who was a banker from Livorno with extensive interests in Naples, stepped in to rescue the newspaper on the condition that Serra and Scarfolio merge their operations with his own newspaper, Il Corriere del Mattino, and relocate to Naples. Scalizzi clearly realized the benefit of owning a newspaper to further his own interest in local politics. It helps when you're bidding for contracts. So Serra returned to Naples. She'd left as a neophyte, she returned as a well-heeled, successful writer and a, with a nationally recognized reputation as a journalist. In Naples, she raised her four sons and she was still to produce her best work. But she also produced some of her least memorable and most commercial work in Naples. There was the execrable Adio Amore, which was apparently one of Queen Margarita's favorites. And she also produced her best, her epic masterpiece, I think, Il Paese di Cucagna. Paese di Cucagna appeared in 1891, and it had a long gestation. There are clear traces of earlier works in there, beginning with Il Ventri di Napoli, and it included elements from Terno Secco, which I translated as lucky numbers, and to a lesser degree, elements of 30%. Like Terno Secco, Il Paese di Cucagna is a depiction of the Neapolitan obsession with the lottery and the ways in which the obsession and delusion affect all classes of people in the city. The descriptive powers are spectacular. Unlike Terno Secco, Il Paese di Cucagna is an epic. The start of the novel opens with an almost cinematic tracking shot of the city. I'm going to read from uh, uh, Anna Banti's, um, Quotation from the novel, if I may. She clearly likes it too, because she's quoted a great deal of Il Paese di Cucagna in this biography. Bene. This is the opening, the tracking shot. Dopo mezzogiorno il solo, il sole penetrò nella piazzetta dei banchi nuovi, allargandosi alla litografia Cardone, alla farmacia K, e di là si venne allungando, risalendo tutta la strada di Santa Chiara, dando un'insolita gaezza di luce a quella via che conserva sempre, anche nelle ore di maggior movimento, un gelido aspetto fra, fra claustrale e scolastico. Ma il gran movimento mattinale di via Santa Chiara, delle persone che scendono dai quartieri settentrionali della città, Avvocata, Stella, San Carlo all'Arena, alla San Lorenzo, e se ne vanno ai quartieri bassi di Porto, Pendino e Mercato, o viceversa, dopo il mezzogiorno, andava lentamente decrescendo. Dandiri viene delle carrozze, dai carri, dei venditori ambulanti, cessava. Era un continuo scantonare per il chiostro di Santa Chiara, per il vico I Foglia, verso la viuzza di Mezzocanone, verso il Gesù Nuovo, verso San Giovanni Maggiore. Presto la gaezza del sole illumina una via ormai solitaria. I mercanti del lato destro di via Santa Chiara, poiché il lato sinistra, sinistro ha solo l'alta, chiusa, bruna, muraglia del convento delle Clarisse. 
mercanti di vecchi mobili polverosi, di meschini e poveretti mobili nuovi, mercanti di stampe colorate e di vivacissime oleografie, mercanti di santo di legno, pranzavano nel fondo nel, delle loro botteghe oscure, sopra un cantuccio di tovaglia macchiate di vino, di vetro verdastro, ah, scusami, di vino, tenendo a fianco del largo piatto di maccheroni la caraffa di verde verdastro piena di vinello di marano e chiusa da una foglia di vite, di vite accartocciata. She describes the people in her novel as well. Many characters in, in, uh, in um, il paese di Cucagna. La folla era fatta quasi tutta di gente povera. And then she describes the gente povera. But it's not only those who are obsessed with the lottery. There's impoverished nobility. There are people who have to go to the users or have to pay the users. And the us users themselves, Caterina Concetta, are, are extraordinary depictions of gangsters, basically. And I think this is where Sirao is at her best. Uh, doubtless a treatment of women as the main protagonists in the romantic dramas, uh, her exploration and understanding the sentiments underlying the dynamic should earn her a place as one of the more progressive women novelists, but probably the most progressive Italian female novelist until Grazia Deletta. But journalism is where Serao came from, and Paese di Cucagna came from her journalism. Paese di Cucagna was and remains Serao's greatest success, but I think both critically and commercially. But Scafoli was about to throw her another curveball. 1892 was a very important year in the Scarfoglio household. Mr. Scarfoglio parted company with his business partner, Matteo Scalizzi. The reasons are unclear, but Scarfoglio naturally tried to pin the blame on Scalizzi. Whatever the ins and outs of the feud, on the 16th of March, 1892, Scarfoglio and Serrao launched a new newspaper for Naples with ambitions to extend circulation throughout the South. It was called Il Mattino, and from the first day, Scarfoglio began to do everything possible to alienate the government in Rome. That summer, and here's the curveball, Serrao was holidaying in the Val d'Aosta while Scafoglio was spending her money in the dance emporia and fresh pots of uh, Rome, where he met a dancer, a French dancer, despite his supposed antipathy to all things French. And her name was Gabrielle Bessard. It wasn't the first time Scafoglio had been unfaithful and it wouldn't be the last time. He joked openly about it in letters, about how Matilda knew about his distractions and that she didn't mind. But in a letter of 1893, Serrao admitted Appena posso, scappa, appena posso scappare per un quarto d'ora, vado ad asciugare le lacrime. The affair with, between Scarfoglio and Bessart continued for over a year when it came to cataclysmic conclusion in the most dramatic fashion. Bessart announced that she was expecting Scarfoglio's child in the hope that it would encourage him to leave his wife. He refused to leave her. I think he knew where this money was coming from. So Gabriel Bessard, poor girl, presented herself at their front door and she shot herself. She was rushed to the hospital, but she died a few days later. The child survived. It was a girl. Matilda Serrao adopted her and she called her Paulina. Despite this, and despite Scarfoglio's increasingly hostile invective towards the government, Serrao stayed by his side, though she knew that their sentimental life together was over. Scarfoglio continued to level criticism at the government. Often it was justified, as it was in the case of the riots of 18, 1848, which culminated in the Bava Beccaris massacre in Milan, when striking laborers were fired on by government troops. It caused anywhere between 100 and 400 casualties, depending on the, the reports that you read. But the ferocity of Scarfoglio's condemnation led to a government sequestration of his newspaper and a couple of months' exile for him in Switzerland. Matilda condemned the attacks too from her columns on their newspaper, Il Mattino. Yet despite the occasional show of political support for the working classes, Matilda continued to be infatuated 
with salons of minor and increasingly major nobility. It was a proclivity she'd had since her days at Rome when she was a close friend and supporter uh, of Eleonora Duse, the most famous actress in Italy, of course, and companion of Gabriele D'Annunzio. Serrao spent huge efforts trying to get her work published in France in this period. And eventually, Paese di Cucagna did get published there in 1899. And Serrao prepared her, her trip to Paris and was soon making ever more frequent visits to the salons of Paris. And she was nursing consistently the hopes of meeting the Empress Eugenie in person. Scarfoglio, meanwhile, happily spent his time in Naples antagonizing the government and spending money on luxuries and yachts. But in 1901, the government appointed Giuseppe Saredo to investigate corruption in the local administration in Naples. There had been a huge building boom, of course, perhaps after the Sventrari Napoli um, episode. And Scafoglio found himself caught up in the inquest. His extravagant lifestyle had attracted a lot of attention and a lot of envy. And of course, Serrao and Scafoglio were a cause celebre after the episode with Gabriel Bessar. Worse still, Serrao herself was accused of all kinds of corrupt practices and profligacy, which was quite unfair in her case. The accusations, at least as far as Matilde were concerned, had no foundation. And to his credit, Scarfoglio did vigorously defend his wife in the newspapers, saying that she was blameless and extremely parsimonious. And I think that she was. But this was the last straw, I think, for Matilda. After being ignored for so many years and, and mistreated, they, Scarf, uh, Matilda finally left Scarfoglio in 1902. By that time, she'd published almost all of her best work. But there are two relatively late novels, I think, which stand out. La Ballerina and Suor Giovanna della Croce. La Ballerina is a very short story. It's a tragic story of a third-rate ballerina. Uh, Serrao is immensely tender in her depiction of Carmela Minimo. Minimo. And, her sim and she's very sympathetic to the poor, shy girl. She's so out of her depth in a squalid world of music hall and vaudeville shows. There's less in these novels of the minute, often repetitive detail that Serrao deployed in her aerial novels, and the action focuses on Carmela. There's a short novella, it has no tricks or pyrotechnics, and it should have earned Serrao greater applause. Another late novel is an understated masterpiece. Sor Giovanna della Croce is a short novel set in the years following La Perez di Roma in 1870, when the government begins to close down some of the religious institutions that were operating throughout Italy. In many cases, these monasteries or convents were the last refuge of people who were way too old and too institutionalized to be able to survive in the outside world. Even Scarfoglio criticized the vindictive cruelty of the government in shutting down some of these institutions without providing a proper alternative or shelter for the, the inmates, the inhabitants. Sor Giovanna's story in, in this story is not a young girl. Her real name is Luisa Bevilacqua. She's a woman, not yet 60 years old, but she spent 40 years of life in the convent. She's classed as fit to work, but what kind of a work can a woman in her situation do? Her family have abandoned her and would only accept her back on the condition that they recover the dowry that was originally paid to the convent. But of course, the government is not willing to repay diaries of that kind. Serrao is masterful in, in Sor Giovanna. Two episodes in Sor Giovanna stand out in particular. There's the delicacy with which Serrao describes the almost unconscious maternal affection that Luisa Belbilacqua, Sor Giovanna, feels for her, her nephew, her sister's son. There is a complication because the father of this child, her sister's husband, is a man with whom Luisa Bevilacqua had been in love in her youth. Another episode in the book is a master stroke. It shows Sor Giovanna taking her seat in the quietest corner of her room, overlooking a very silent, 
shut up house, which seems to her to be reminiscent of the austere convent that she had left. When what she's looking at is in fact a house of ill repute, a casa di tolleranza. It's a cruel twist, but I think it's poignant. In terms of narrative voice in these novels, Sirao had matured a great deal. There's a scene um, in the book which involves a visit from a Suor, Suor Francesca delle Sette Parole to Suor Giovanna. And he goes that seduto, sedute una di fronte all'altra, coi piedi sui freddi mattoni, con le mani nascoste nell'ampiezza delle maniche monacale, le due vecchie si guardavano volta a volta con occhi teneri e triste e volta a volta ripigliavano un discorso lento e sommesso. Le due monache restavano sole in queste visite e un po' taciturne, taciturne in sulle prime, guardandosi nel volto come per riconoscersi meglio. Guarda, guardandosi nel volto come per riconoscersi meglio. Two women who have lived under the same roof in a small community for 40 years. I think that sentence is, is just the most wonderful observation. After these novels, Sirao didn't really, she continued to write. She set up her own newspaper, in fact, Il Giorno, where she, in 1903, she met a new interest, a man called Giuseppe Natale, who was a lawyer, who was also a journalist who worked on the newspaper. And together they lived and they worked on Il Giorno until 1917 when Scarfoglio died. And when Scarfoglio died, Sirao and Giuseppe Natale were married. And perhaps she found happiness with Natale, I do hope so. She did write, she experimented with various types of writing. Uh, one of the novels, that uh, I think was a big experiment was um, La Mano Tagliata, which was translated as The Severed Hand, kind of Edgar Allan Poe type Gothic novel. But in a world where the big names now were D'Annunzio, her, her friend for life, and Pirandello, Sirao's race as a writer was run. She did have much more to say she opposed Italy's participation in the First World War, more from the point, not from a political point of view, but more from the point of view as mother. And she expressed, I think, for all of the women who were sending their, their sons off to fight in the war, the First War, she expressed their fears and their regrets. She opposed fascism. Uh, she was an opponent of Mussolini, I think a bit of a gadfly, really. And some people suggest that that was why when uh, the, the Nobel Prize for Literature was, was awarded in 27, it didn't go to Sirao, despite the uh, numerous um, uh, uh, times that she'd been proposed for the, the Nobel Prize. It went instead to Grazia de Leda, which I think possibly on reflection, de Leda was the correct recipient. But Sirao had opened doors for these writers. Sirao had been the trailblazer. She'd, the one, she'd been the one, I think, who had created a space in which women writers were more able to express themselves more freely than they had ever done before. And I think that she deserves full credit for that. I think she deserves full recognition for that. And personally, I would love to continue to uh, translate her work. I know above all those later novels, to, uh, like uh, Suor uh, Giovanna della Croce, which is a hard sell, of course, but I think a, a wonderful story, um, and La Ballerina. So I reached the end of my story of Matilde Serrao. Um, I'll be happy to discuss her with you. Grazie, Michael. Grazie tantissime. Eh, I think uh, we also have to say that you translated Giovanni Berga, Di Malavoglia e Mastro Don Gesualdo, if we forgot to say that at the beginning. Yes, yes, that's right. Anybody has a question? 
I'm getting a huge amount of echo on the line. Is anyone else getting that? I'll take care of the question. Marta. Marta, non ti sentiamo. Yes. Okay. That's fine. Non la sentiamo. Non la sentiamo. <laughs> so Martin, you need to turn on your microphone. I'm sorry? That's cool. Can it you hear me? Marta. No, Michele, see, we, we can hear you, but we cannot hear Marta. Uh, Marta, okay. Does anybody have a question? There you go. I do. Lita, do you Go see ahead. me? Okay, do you see me? Yes. Yeah. All right, my question is, as you introduced this fantastically fascinating lecture, you mentioned that um, uh, this was in honor of International Women's Day. And I just love seeing so many women here gathered to honor this great female author whose books I will immediately buy. I was not aware of her before. I'd like to ask how International Women's Day is celebrated in Italy. Right now, this is my good question you can answer because I really- no, I, Well, I would rather leave don't that to you. Don't celebrate Women's Day on that in, on that sense that you can imagine, because it's not it's not a festa, it's not a celebration, it's a remembrance of uh, something of, that the woman need to uh, always achieving a long time ago. So it's not really a celebration. A long time ago, it started with you know feminismo in Italy, my uh, my time, but then uh, change it. But is è una ricorrenza più che una una festa. Although although the the men in our life do tend to bring us a flower. On. A so. special flower? Mimosa. 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 Okay. Not the drink. <laughs> the flower. If you're lucky, your husband brings you both. So, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I think from what I've read, that International Women's Day was declared in Italy after the First World War or the Second World War because of the participation of women in the war. Yeah, so the, basically their input in when all the men went to actually fight the war, the women went into the factories and took took their place. So absolutely, yes. Good job, Lita. Really? Like like in the United States? How marvelous. I didn't know that. Thank in you. Turn, we can say that you know, the uh, March 8th, March 8th and I'm reading this because it's nice to read this to remember all the battles fought by women in the social, economic, and political fields. I think this is the sentence that is fit perfectly for March 8th. Thank you. We just happened to extend it onto the whole month because we felt that one day wasn't enough. It should actually be all year. <laughs> mm -hmm. but al already the men grumble that we have a day, let alone a month. So, you know, we- I agree. <laughs> we we let them believe that, I mean, for centuries they've they've had it their way, but we were always really leading from behind. 
<laughs> yes, thank you. <laughs> Do we have any more questions for Michael? I have one, if nobody else. Um, I think the biggest criticism to Matilde was that she was too um, interested, as you said, in the gossip, in the in the saloni bene of the nobility, etc. Um, I think it, it, you know, in a way, it's it's trying to, you know, get that feel good story as well. Like now, if you look at the news cycle, we won't even begin to get into it. But I mean, you know, the fact of being able to tell some stories without some sort of dystopian um, visions, I think that is what really so, sort of sets her apart at the time, besides the fact that she was a woman and that she was able to get hugely popular. So what would you say against those critics? Do you agree? I mean, what's your... No, I wouldn't agree. I think, you know, it's a perfectly natural impulse, a human impulse. She, she came from a relatively, well, from a very modest background. Um, and as a successful woman, she was entitled to, you know, whatever success could bring. She was a great friend of Eleonora Duse. They had their ups and downs, you know, sometimes they fell out and sometimes they were the best of friends. Sometimes um, sit out, Duse get a bit... Um, <laughs> Uh, what upset with with Sirao's in advice interventions, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but after Eleonora Duse's death, uh, Sirao wrote an article. Uh, oh, sorry, yes, wrote an article um, which is quoted in Anabanti's book, in fact, which was a very very vigorous defense of Eleonora Duse and said that she was never appreciated in her own country. A prophet never is, um, and that she was very much better known outside of Italy than she was inside. Um, I think that uh, Serao herself said very tellingly that when she attended these salons, uh, um, the women would treat her as some kind of curiosity because physically she was short, she was, you know, rotund. Um, she was not physically, by her own statement, uh, you know, a, an elegant or beautiful woman. Um, but uh, she said that she observed the women in the salons and she put them in her books, which she did. So it was finding material for her books. Now, no one would criticize someone like Evelyn Waugh, for example, for writing Brideshead Revisited, which is set in a stately home in the UK. So I don't think you can level criticism at Serao for finding material in the Salotti Buoni of Rome or, or in Naples as it stood. And Edith Wharton also uh, made a very telling observation. Uh, she was quoted as saying, Serao appears in the room, she looks bizarre in her costume, in the way she presents herself. But when she opens her mouth, you can see that she's far and away the most intelligent woman in the room. And I think, you know, coming from Edith Wharton, I'd be happy to we'll take, take that it. as a valid observation. Yeah. I would love to have had her in my salon. I mean, like, can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a character. It was quite interesting. She uh, apparently, she said when she went to Paris at 1899, after she just published the Paese de Cucagna, she went to Paris to attend the Salon in Paris. Um, she, she wrote a letter in advance to someone saying that she'd learned how to behave like a lady and she didn't laugh quite as loud. And after she appeared there, um, of course, I can't remember a French writer, it wasn't Bourget, but one of the writers who attended one of these Salons said, well, I'd never heard uh, Gustave Flaubert laugh and Gustave Flaubert was a big man. He said, I'd never heard Gustave Flaubert laugh, madam, but..." If he laughed, he would have laughed exactly the way you did. So, you know, she clearly hadn't quieted down at all. One of the other criticisms of her, I think, uh, was the um, Cavalieri dello Spirito episode where she got very spiritual. And after a visit, I think, to, the, to Palestine, to the Holy Land, um, she became a great follower of Paul Bourget. And she suggested that Paul Bourget and Fogazzari and, and people like he, they should be a new movement, a new spiritual movement to counteract the verismo that had gone before, to which she'd been very attached at one stage of her life, comparing herself even to people like Verga 
and um, oh gosh, uh, Capuano and, and people like this. So you know, I think uh, that that I think is a valid criticism. That period of spirituality, I think, where she kind of went back on her her roots, her origins. But I think it was a brief period because she could easily have gone overboard with Sor Giovanna, which is essentially a book about a woman who'd left a religious institution, but she didn't. She concentrated very much on the woman and not on the spiritual aspect of the woman, which I think was the, the right thing to do. It makes it quite a powerful book, in my opinion. Grazie, Michael. I know it's very late in London, of course, and um, okay. I think we can uh, close this uh, wonderful presentation. Right, Daniela? I also want to introduce uh, Sharice Manganiello. You want to say some words? Yes, hi, everyone. I'm Sharice Manganiello. I'm the membership chair for Dante Alighieri, and I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. You, our members, are the reason why we can give have these presentations with authors like Michael and the others. So thank you for your continued support. If you haven't renewed yet, there's no time like the present. And if you are someone who just found us through a friend or online, consider joining us because we can, um, will help us to continue to present these awesome speakers and events to all of you. Thank you. Uh, I see Caroline, uh, do you wanna say something, Caroline? Yes, I, I did have a question. <clears throat> Uh, for Michael, uh, during your time of researching and also doing the translations of the two books you have out uh, and maybe talking with others about her, what came out as something that you felt was most impressive? Maybe that's too hard to pick one thing, but maybe you could come up with a feeling or an emotion or... Um, something that happened during that time in your knowledge and your appreciation of her? Well, I think it's hard to say in one word um, to separate her writing from the person. I think her resilience, you know, mm. she, she came from nowhere. She created a career for herself at a time when that was a virtually impossible thing to do. Mm -hmm. And she stayed married to a man who was, who must have been impossible. She raised four boys, adopted a girl who was the daughter of her husband's lover. Um, she co-founded three newspapers and founded a newspaper. You know, her strength, her Never resilience, her up. energy are just amazing. Up. Amazing. So it's her yeah. ability to move forward, to never give up. Never Absolutely. Give up. Nice. Yeah. And to, to prosper from it, to grow with all of that. I think she grew very much, yes, as a person, I think she did. Uh, you know, there are, there are places where peers when I think one sees her being you know, a little bit superficial, um, that period, the late 1880s, before she produced, I think, two of her finest works. Um, but she went, I think, from strength to strength. And I think um, in her later life, you know, the, uh, having founded her own newspaper, I think was a huge, huge achievement. Wonderful. Yeah. Yep. Grazie tanto. Grazie, Caroline. I see grazie. many members of the Dante Society. I also see members co connected from Lake Como. Ciao, Giovanna. Very nice to see you. Uh, it's late in Lake Como as well. Uh, un saluto anche a Franco Iaderosa from the Noi Foundation. Michael, it was a grazie. pleasure to listen to you. Grazie, Thank you very Dante. much. It's a joy to see you. Buona domenica. Buona domenica. Happy Sunday. Buona domenica. La prossima.